Hey guys, my name is Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert Administrator. I create a lot of content for MSPs. In today's video, I'm going to be showing you guys how to create a configuration profile in Intune for macOS devices. This is a video part of a series I'm creating for macOS management with Intune. So stay tuned for more information and more videos around macOS devices in general. Here though, we're in the Endpoint Manager Admin Center and I'm gonna walk you through most common configuration profiles I see for Macs. And we'll walk you through all of the various settings that you can have on there and I'll show you what this looks like from an end user device standpoint as well too. So the configuration profiles we can set up here for this device allows us to change certain settings and provide certain restrictions on devices. These three that I've added here, as far as the profile types, we have one for device restrictions, one for device features, and then one for endpoint protection. And I'll be walking through each one of those today. So let's start with device features, just because that's a pretty common one that you'll wanna set up. For the settings here, we'll go in, you can name this whatever you want, platform could be Mac OS, but I'll go through each one of these settings here. So for AirPrint, you can cut, customize the printers here that you want to set up. That will be available on the Mac prematurely so that you don't have to manually configure those or someone within the organization doesn't have to do that. It also allows you as the IT administrator to maintain a certain level of compliance by saying, hey, you're going to use this, this printer and they don't have any question on what printer to use. So you can pre-configure this and they'll already have it available. It's good for just ease of use here. For the login items, this is going to show you know which apps, files, and folders open when they log into the device. You may want to define this, you may not. You may have certain applications that you want to boot up every time they log into that particular device if you are managing it, but this is available to you to customize. For the login window here, you can customize the window layout. You can show additional information, but like it's saying here, it's just the host name and Mac OS version when the menu bar is clicked. So typically I just leave that alone. For the banner, this is what they see on their lock screen as a message to them whenever they're logging in. You can just have the corporate name like I did here as an example. Require username and password. Um, this is something that you can set up and if you do say require here, it's gonna remove all the other available users from the device and this may be what you want. You may want them to put that in. With Mac OS devices, you can synchronize them and join them to a local domain. So if you've had that, the authentication then lies with Azure Active Directory. So you wouldn't have to worry about this as much. If you didn't want to require this and require them to just have as many profiles as they want on there, they could show other users, they could show you know the network users, mobile accounts, local users you can hide as well too, if you didn't want them to be able to see that for some reason. So it really depends on what devices this is uh, to the users who you're gonna to scope to as far as when you assign this policy. So if it's BYOD devices, this may be not something you wanna to touch, but if they're corporate owned devices, you may just want them to log in with the username and password and not see any other account. So I would definitely take an eye to that one, but that's kind of what that means there. These settings here, I generally don't touch because this is only if you want to restrict them from seeing the shutdown, restart, or sleep button. So that's not something I usually want to even get into because I do want them to have the ability to do that. Disable user login from the console. This is if you're using the command line, the Mac OS command line, and giving them the ability to do that. I just disable it because it's not like our end users are going to be doing that or should be doing that. And then from the Apple menu, you could disable certain features that you see here. Again, for this, I don't consider this to be something I would do. This is generally, in my opinion, if you're using the Mac OS more so as like a kiosk device or something like that, where many people are logging into it you know, in a, in a community location versus just to a personal user. Single sign-on app extension. This is for enterprise level companies in my opinion. It's where you've developed a proprietary application and you want single sign-on between the actual application and in the web. So they have different SSO extension types here that you can use to set up that SSO integration for. I'm not gonna get into that. I think it's not gonna be widely used in the SMB space. 
Associated domains are really a piggyback off of that as well too. You can share credentials between single sign-on between the org apps and websites and you can put in Apple ID here in the name so that they can easily move back and forth between the applications and they don't have to sign in every time and causing that frustration. So those two really don't consider in the SMB market could be used widely but there may be a few exceptions here or there. Whenever you've always assigned or added a configuration profile, you're always going to be asked to assign it to a certain group or all users. And in this case, I'm not going to worry about those edits. I, I just said all users and all devices. I'm not going to have any variance in the login types that I'm using. They're all going to be managed by my company. So I don't have any regard for BYOD devices. Those aren't going to access my corporate resources. So in this case, I leave my settings and I say all users and devices. The next profile I want to look at is device restrictions. So with device restrictions, we have our properties here. And within our settings, we'll click on general to start. Um, these ones up top here, the only one I consider to be valuable is um, content caching and defer software updates. So the ones that you see up here, um, as far as content caching, you can block this to try to improve performance around certain updates and then you can defer certain software updates if you have certain applications that may get broken or become broken I should say whenever you make these security updates because it doesn't work with the updated OS so you can choose to defer the OS updates here you may be just using your RMM tool to control the updates on across all devices so that may not even be a consideration you would even want to turn on or enable. But this is something where you have the ability to configure that here. The other one you want to consider again when you're looking at BYOD versus personally owned devices. Screenshots may be something that you want to block on BYOD devices just so they're not taking screenshots of their own um, or corporate data and sending it insecurely. But that's going to be something that you heavily have to assess and maybe that's just an opt-in you have with a particular client as well just to make sure that you know you're covering all bases there with the bottom enrollment types here as well too uh, this is for Apple uh, management with classroom for students and I'm not going to really cover that I don't, I'm not going to get into that as part of this. this is meant for the business sector for passwords here, um, if you watched my video on compliance policies, you know that we set up certain compliance policy with certain password requirements to make that device compliant. So here we just want to mimic that in the sense of requiring a password, requiring it to be alphanumeric, blocking simple passwords, and after the lock screen, the password's immediately supposed to be prompted here. You can define the minutes, but I choose immediately each time. Maximum minute of inactivity. We touched on this, especially around compliance related firms, regulations. Um, you want this to be relatively quickly, quick, but not in the sense where it's immediately um, complicated to the end user or frustrating to the end user. So password expiration, prevent your use is here as well too. You can block the user from modifying their passcode if you really wanted. You could block fingerprint unlock, which I really don't advise. You block password autofill, and this would you know prevent them from autofilling the password there. You could block proximity requests, which I did here, and that's just coming from outside. And password sharing as well too. You can prevent that. So these are some of the common settings for the password there. Built-in applications. Um, these ones here you can you can touch if you want. Safari autofill, you can block the camera, you can block Apple Music, Spotlight Internet search results, and file transfer using iTunes. All of these, again, general consideration to the business. You may not want to even touch any of these, except for maybe file transfer to iTunes. But it's, it's really up to you and what you've decided as a, a compliance policy. You can restrict certain applications here by their app bundle ID in the publisher. So if you want to blacklist some certain applications from the users from accessing those on the Mac devices, you can do that here. Connected devices, you can block AirDrop. 
So this is more of a security concern to me that I would want to block in the sense that somebody could be deploying some type of malicious payload through AirDrop that the user is accepting and getting access to corporate data. But the other one here, block app, pull, watch, auto unlock, not really a consideration, but you can block that if you want. And then for cloud and storage here, you can block the um, iCloud settings as far as the backups goes and handoff as well too. So with this, this you got to be careful with this one again. This is more so aligned with if you have a managed Apple ID and they're backing up devices there or if they are using a corporate owned device and it's something where they still have a personal iCloud account on there, you'd be blocking them from syncing that data. But if it's BYOD, you have to be really careful with this because then they wouldn't be able to back up to any iCloud account. Um, so just be careful there. Handoff, uh, this allows you to transfer between your macOS and iOS device in, immediately. So I generally choose to, to block that, but again, it's it's giving you the ability to stop that as well too. The main point with that one is if I am not managing the iOS device, I would allow you to transfer data back and forth between a managed device and an unmanaged device. So for the domains, you know, it's basically straightforward here. It says that the user sends receive, which don't match the domain you specify here, will be marked as untrusted. So that's using the native app on a Mac OS, not Outlook. So just take note of that as well too. In most cases, I feel like you guys would be using Outlook and pushing that application for accessing their mail. But if they set up the corporate uh, profile on their Mac OS and you define the blacklisted email addresses as well here too. So the last one I want to touch on is endpoint protection. This one to me is probably the most important because of the file vault settings that you set up here. So Gatekeeper we touched on in the compliance policy in the other video, but with this one, you know, we're just saying that we're allowing you to download apps from these locations and we say the Mac App Store because that's more of a trusted location versus just getting it from an untrusted location where the app could potentially have malicious content. It's not been vetted by an elevated third party. And then we're blocking them from overriding Gatekeeper as well too. For the firewall settings, we're gonna enable the firewall on the device. We're going to block incoming connections. And this is going to require those for basic internet services like DHCP, Bonjour, and IPsec. So those are the most common ones, and it's going to block things like remote connection and screen share abilities that are native to the Mac device itself. You can whitelist and blacklist certain applications to allow for those incoming connections. And this will, you know, you'll have to do some playing around with your stack that you have that you usually push out to the end users. But most of the time, you're gonna block these, you know, block the firewall, have a zero trust model in that sense and configure it appropriately. Last one here is for File Vault. This is the encryption of the drive and you can enable that and the only available option here is personal key. But this messaging you send here is going to tell the user where they can get their File Vault recovery key. If they go to the Security and Privacy Center and they don't have File Vault turned on but you've required it as a compliance policy when they go into their settings and go turn it on, it'll it'll pop up with this message and have this message for them that says that they can go into the port, company portal website to get that key. For the personal recovery key rotation, this is an application of a, a new encryption key that'll be populated every month here. And you know you, that way you can do this automatically without manually having to rotate the key. And you can disable the prompt at sign out. I don't... Uh, configure this because I want the user to enable this immediately and the number of times allowed to bypass. If you set it to not configure, they don't have any choice. They need to go set it up immediately or else their device isn't compliant and they have no option. So you want to do this. If you give them the ability to, to bypass it, they can say, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, I'll do it later, up to the number that you've defined here. So it's good to, to do that. I, I recommend going in and um, saying not configured for that just so they get it encrypted immediately. 
You can say OK, and that is the, all the settings that we wanted to do there as far as the device configuration profiles. So let me pop into an end user device just to show you guys what this looks like from the Mac standpoint. So back on a Mac device here, we've had a user who's enrolled via the company portal app and they've had all the profile configuration settings pushed down. So we're just gonna take a look at a couple here that have changed on the device. So if we go into the security and privacy tab on the Mac, you'll see here that we can't change the password or we can't change the sleep settings there. File Vault has been encrypted, and the firewall has been turned on without the ability for us to go ahead and change that. Additionally here we have in the application section, I'm gonna to go to the iCloud account. If you've pushed out applications, they'll show up here as well, which is what I was showing there. And if you go to the iCloud drive and look at the preferences, it will pull this up here and here you can see there's certain things that are restricted like the keychain access there if you'd set that to block and they don't have the ability to access that and then if I go to the lock screen you'll notice there's my branded banner messaging there with my company profile and if they go to sign in here like this it'll ask them if their password's not meeting your requirements to go ahead and set that password. I just took a screenshot of it. So it's saying, hey, look here, you have to have you know this many characters, this many um, symbols or anything like that that you define. And they are immediately prompted on the next sign in to go ahead and change that so they can reset their password to meet your configuration profile and compliance needs there. So that's everything I did want to show you guys. The one thing I wanted to point out um, with endpoint protection is with the properties that you see here, or if you go into a device, I should say, let's go that way. And you look at a device here and you go under device configuration, you'll be able to see if there's anything in error that hasn't successfully pushed out. And when you click on that, you have some certain error messages here. So this is a good example where File Vault was already encrypted or enabled by the end user. So this is saying, hey, in order for us to encrypt the device and get the recovery key so we can manage it, we need them to decrypt it and so we can apply the managed profile encryption to the drive and we have that recovery key that's rotating. So this will be an error and that's a common one you probably will see if they already had that turned on. If not, your profile configuration will push out and you'll have that here so that you can manage that key over time. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to show you guys. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Like or subscribe to the channel if you guys would like to see more content around Intune and Microsoft 365. Thanks guys, have a great day.